Hello, everybody, and welcome to Taking Control, the ADHD podcast on True Story FM. I'm Pete Wright, and right over there is Nikki Kinzer. After I take a drink of yeah, my coffee. Is, Hello, everyone. Welcome. We've learned nothing <laughs> about podcasting. Don't drink right? on your line. Is, the timing is <laughs> off here for me already this morning. Oh, well. Okay. Uh, I'm back on target. We are continuing our job series. And this week, it's we're sort of inserting an episode because we were so deeply inspired by our mm-hmm. members only happy hour that happened at the beginning of this very month. Uh, the month of what month are we in? It was actually was May. it May? The May happy hour was just last week. So uh, w- as we record this, so by the time you hear this, some weeks will have passed. Uh, but we started talking about uh, red flags about halfway through this conversation, our, our happy hour conversation, and people had red flags at work. Red yes, they did. flags at work, and I kept thinking red flags at morning. In- Employees are something. Red flags at night. Workers delight. No, there's a there's a there's a <laughs> sea shanty or something. It's about red skies and things. I was trying to come up with some sort of a pirate metaphor all morning. I've been trying to. Okay, it did, never worked. Never worked. Anyway, people had thoughts about red flags, yes. things that they experienced and maybe should have seen in in the rear view. Had they only known better, et cetera. We have lots of great examples. So we're going to talk a little bit about um, our own red flags and red flags, way to see some red flags and maybe some signals that you should keep in your back pocket. So you know when you should be even looking for red flags. So that's what that's we're going right. to talk about today. We have a couple of big announcements. Uh, first of all, you know where to find us, TakeControlADHD.com. Uh, and uh, jump into the Discord server, TakeControlADHD.com slash Discord. It's a fantastic place with a growing, enthusiastic community of members all living with ADHD, supporting one another. It is the greatest, greatest, greatest place on the internet. Um, and of, of course, if you really love it and you want to see all the, the super double, triple secret channels that you don't get access to uh, in the public, then you should visit Patreon, patreon.com slash the ADHD podcast. That's our member support program. If you want to support what we do here, if you want to see it continue to grow and thrive, uh, toss us a few bucks a month uh, over at Patreon, and that will help a lot and get you access to early episodes of the podcast with extra stuff and um, the access to all the super triple secret channels in discord it's really really great so we appreciate you doing that thank you so so much and now we do have a couple of announcements for all yes we have some yeah. summer events that are uh, happening so i want me uh, make sure everyone knows that we still have a few days left to sign up for the next installment of the adhd book club I am so excited to be exploring James Ochoa's book. As you all know, James has been a guest here eight times now. Eight times, yes. Eight times. Wow. Good good friend of the show. And uh, his book, Focus Forward, Navigating the Storms of Adult ADHD, is the book that we are going to be exploring. And he has graciously uh, committed to joining us in two of our sessions. It's an eight-week Uh, book club. So I would love to have you join me. I have this book. I've read this book. I love this book. I give it to clients. And I am really excited about uh, sharing this book with a group of people that we can really sit and talk about it and uh, really understand what James work, what his work is all about. So important. So the deadline is to, uh, to enroll is May 31st. We also have another deadline on May 31st. The deadlines are stacking up right now. They are. Declutter Challenge is happening this summer, June 2023. And I am really excited to get this challenge started. If you've been a longtime listener of the show, you know that my garage has been a toleration for me far too long. And that is my main focus in June of 2023. My goal is to get this garage in some kind of order, not perfection, but some kind of order. Uh, so I want you to come uh, with me along on this journey. We have a game we're going to play. I have a couple of webinars that I'm going to share with you on how to organize, how to get started, and then how to maintain. And uh, we also have work sessions that we're going to be doing in uh, on Saturdays in June too. So lots of great things. Uh, you can find both of these events on our website, takecontroladhd.com slash book club for the book club, takecontroladhd.com slash 
declutter if you'd like to declutter. You should totally declutter. Everyone should declutter, yes. but also book club. It's going to be a fun, fun June uh, in uh, Take Control. So, Absolutely. This week's episode is brought to you by Text Expander, one of the best invisible tools in my tech tool chest. Here's how it works. If there's a piece of text that I type more than once, that's a signal I need to add it to Text Expander. So I keep my most used emails, phrases, text messages, URLs, and so much more right in my Text Expander library. A snippet can include text, links, images, code, account numbers, phone numbers, addresses, whatever you want. The trick is, for each one of those snippets in my library, I assign a unique abbreviation. Then I expand it. I can deploy the current text that I need with just a few keystrokes on any device across any apps I use. Just type the abbreviation for the snippet I'm looking for and boom, text expanded. You can even get your whole team or family access to all the content they need to use every single day. Organize it by department and group and make sure that all of your snippets are used consistently wherever they're needed. This month, we're talking about red flags at work. And I've got to tell you, one of the red flags, if, if you're dealing with this, just like I do, Text Expander might be able to help. It's the frequent little typographical mistakes. My brain, it just moves too fast to catch little errors when I'm typing quickly. And I, we're talking about things like brand names and technical terms, things that are unique to my business that don't usually get caught by spell check. So I put these terms in my text expander library, and then I never miss them. Example, live stream. We do a live stream on this show. And for a long time, live stream was accepted as a single word. But now more and more, it is two words. It's split up live and stream. Well, I still type it as live stream. Spell check doesn't catch it. So I added it to text expander. And now every time I type the word live stream, it separates it to live and stream. And I don't have to do anything. It just fixes the, the issue instantly, automatically, and effortlessly. Text Expander is available on Mac, Windows, Chrome, iPhone, and iPad. And for listeners of the ADHD podcast, you can get 20% off your first year of service. All you have to do is visit takecontroladhd.com slash text expander, and you'll be whisked over to our page on their site where you can get started. Again, get started now. You'll save 20% off your subscription takecontroladhd.com slash text expander. The way we work is changing rapidly. Make work work the way your brain works by saying more in less time with less effort using text expander. Our great thanks to the text expander team for sponsoring the ADHD podcast. We do have an answer uh, from the ADHD community. I neglected to mention, if you become a member at patreon.com slash the ADHD podcast, you get to join us for the live chat of the live show and watch us record live. And Casey does report red flags in the morning. That's your warning. Red flags at night. Quit now. Don't even show up the next morning, which is <laughs> probably closer to the truth than any of us want to admit. We are talking about red That's flags. Right. Where would you Where would you like to start? with this conversation on red flags. Well, it looks like Melissa, our uh, lovely brain trust partner, wants us to start with our own past job <laughs> stories. <laughs> well, that was me. I actually wanted to do that. I added oh. this whole per this first little section on top of Melissa's okay. stuff because I want to hear your red flags because you uh, have, have worked for a long time. And, uh, you know, even though you and I have been doing this for, for doing this kind of working for ourselves thing for a while, we have company experience. What, what are, do. Do, you, do you have yeah. any experience with red flags yourself? Because I do. You know, I've had a pretty, I've been pretty lucky. I've worked for some pretty good people. I think the red flags, it hasn't so much been like the companies that I've worked for, the people that I've uh, worked for. It's been the type of jobs. Like I've really kind of figured out what I wanted, what I was good at, what I wanted to do and what I didn't want to do. Yeah. And um, I think that was the biggest thing is, is the sales. I'm not a good salesperson. Mm -hmm. I didn't like being a salesperson. And I did that for a temporary service. And I did it for a very short period of time. And I got lucky and I got a really big client. And, uh, but you only get those clients 
for like a, a short period of time where you still get commission on them. And mm-hmm. then like you have to go find new business. That's mm-hmm. the thing about sales is you can't just Terrible. ride your current business. Right. You're supposed to go find new business. And uh, oh, I did not like the cold calling, the calling on, because this was back in the 90s. So, I mean, that's really aging me. Yeah, it was. It was back in the like mid to late 90s. And uh, everything was different. I mean, it was actually picking up a phone call or a phone, a, a real phone mm-hmm. in your office and With calling a, cord. a bunch of companies. Right. Yeah. And then having the map, not a GPS, an actual map in your car to try to figure out where you were going. That's the Thomas Guide. Do you remember the, the Thomas, Thomas guide? guide? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. That job was not for me. Uh, mm-hmm. Yeah. So that that would be the thing that I, I would say is that I really just figured out more about what I didn't like and what I liked. And I actually, the last job I had in, with a company was human resources. And I, I really enjoyed that job. Yeah, I yeah. really did love it. And I loved the people I worked with and the company was great. And, uh, and it was hard to leave. Uh, but yeah. uh, I did. I, uh, my best, this, it, it's funny, as I was thinking about this this morning, I was going through what are the things that have, re- that I've really struggled with in my sort of pre ADHD career, like the stuff that, that I didn't know I should know about the unknown unknowns. Right. And, mm-hmm. uh, and, and I realized there are, there are a few, like my first, my first job that wasn't like a, working in the tourist industry as a high schooler, right? I was working in a television station and it was cataloging old tapes. So I had to go through this vast library, this endless dark hallway that had three quarter inch tapes, uh, like news tapes, all up uh, aligning all the walls. And I had to go one by one, put them in the drive and log in this brand new computer system what the stories were at what time code on each of the tapes so that, you know, when you're filing new stories, you can go back to file footage very, very easily. So I was essentially a glorified video librarian doing a ton of data entry. Right. And I realized that was probably one of my best jobs for personality because I could get a uh, go over to the 7-Eleven next door and get a uh, like a big gulp that, you know, that was like a woe gulp, like the size of my head and bigger. Right. And I could <laughs> um, and and I could, you know, hyper focus with my stimulant and do that for hours and hours and hours. And nobody ever bugged me. And they just knew that as long as they could go into the computer and find the stories that they wanted and that library was growing, they never questioned what I was doing. It was as soon as I had responsibilities and deadlines that um, that I started struggling. Those were the things that, that got in the way. And I didn't know that it there should be red flags that I should know about. The more and 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 i was you know really really good at lying to myself at convincing myself that doing one thing was of value even when i was asked to do a different thing and mm. uh, so things like missing deadlines i was constantly missing deadlines and you know the news business is run on uh, very tight deadlines. schedules right it's very, right. very deadline oriented and so i had to get a handle of that i was making you know i would start making mistakes that i would be caught on multiple times like misspellings names those kinds of things that i just wasn't paying attention to the detail, uh, you know, when I got thrown, was I resilient enough? Did I have the sort of was I able to recover and and come mm-hmm. back? What, what were the things my manager was calling me on in terms of we know you're overloaded, but you're not catching up? Like, what are we got to do to catch up? And and then, uh, you know, the uh, complete other side of that is dealing with and learning to live with a complete lack of feedback, right? Like, when I don't know if what I am doing is is good or not. And those sort of make for a catalog of the things that I was struggling with before I realized I had ADHD. And, yes, yeah. And, and I realize only in hindsight now that I was being given a gift by having a manager that would talk to me about them, right? That would talk right. to me about them before, you know, repercussions uh, occurred. Mm-hmm. And that was... Um, that was a big deal. I, I think now had I had the systems that I have now that I count on now, like a big visual tool to tell me here are the deadlines, right? Like if I had gone to the trouble of creating and using whiteboards and doing the kinds of things I do now, 
it would have been a different experience. If I had, you know, had, a, if I I'd thought to ask like, hey, producer, I need you to look at the work that I've done today and check me on my spellings and, and make sure, like if I had called to account an accountability buddy, like I, I would have done a different kind of job, a different level mm-hmm. of quality, right? Uh, mm-hmm. it, those are the things that I, I think I was, I was counting as red flags that I, you know, given with the gift of hindsight, no, now could have handled better and just Mm -hmm. just didn't. Um, So I don't know. Is that a is that a fine way to set the table for our own red flags? Yes, I think so. Because I think, you know, from our conversation the other night, I I feel like some of these things kind of uh, uh, bubble up to, you know, what other people were talking about. And I realized just how much I was able to relate to them. Absolutely. Well, and what was so great about the happy hour conversation is it it, it gave us this topic and it gave us our our next topic too yeah. that we're going to talk about right. eventually. But um I love that we're talking about this because it's when you're doing a job series, we will typically talk about what kinds of jobs are good for ADHD. How do you know, it's about the interview process, it's about all of this stuff, but it's not really about finding the right job for you in as much detail as we're going to be talking about and really looking for those red flags or at least being aware of them when they pop up. So yeah. I love the angle that we're doing. Here. Yeah, me too. Great. And it does start with the red flags that pop up before you get the job. And this is probably a, a good one to start with just because one, I know there are people in our community who are who are looking for work right now. And because of the economic conditions in which we live, there is an increased sense of weight and stress on finding the job and just saying yes to what comes. And so it's important to be aware of the red flags maybe before you jump to a yes so that you can poke around and ask some more questions, Mm -hmm. right? Um, Mm -hmm. The first one was an interesting one that that came, uh, uh, came about talking about just when you're hunting for the job and it was you find a position and the position has been posted for a long time. Like they, they are clearly struggling to fill this position. Mm -hmm. Um, and, it, you know, we've, we've got uh, Melissa posted in, in our notes a quote from Monster.com, quote, this may be a sign that the company has put the position on hold or has high turnover for reasons that might raise concern. And sometimes companies will collect resumes just for the sake of gathering information about current salary conditions. So I, I think both of those things are true. I think having been on the inside trying to fill positions like this, it could also mean that the company is dysfunctional at a very core level, that they can't find someone who sticks. Um, and, and it, it could just mean that it's high turnover cause it's a bad job. And, and I think that's a, something to be aware of. It's something to be aware of and it's something to ask about. Yeah. I, I I'm going to talk a little bit more about this when we talk about the interview, but it, that's a great question to ask when you're in the interview is how long has this been, how long has the position been opened? Why is it opened? Like, is it a new position or is it a current position that you're trying to fill? And, uh, you know, really asking those questions around this job and hearing what they have to say, because it it is, it is a key, doesn't mean that it's a no go for the job. I mean, but it's something like you said, be aware of and ask questions about. Yeah, yeah. Which, which leads to like, what are the key words that the job uh, is actually selling. And, and one of the key words that we're, that we're looking for is competitive salary, right? Oh, this job offers a competitive salary. Competitive with what, right? They want you to think it's competitive with the market. Like it's competitive that w- with, with other positions that might be recruiting you on your very best day, but it could really be competitive with the bottom of the market. It could be competitive Mm -hmm. with entry level. It could be competitive with like it ends up being competitive salary ends up being kind of nonsense words like there's no number associated with it. And competitive salary doesn't take into account your specific offer as somebody who's willing to come and and deliver their blood and sweat to to the organization. Um, So this is interesting because. um, I see both sides. Sure. Because I'm in HR. Right. I'm in HR. I see both sides. I see why you don't, as a company, you don't necessarily want to put the 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 number out there because you don't want to sway people one way or the other. Um, and you want people to apply who are interested in the job. Um, but this is interesting. I was talking to a friend of mine who does hiring and now in Oregon in the current climate. 
And we were talking about this because I was asking her how much she was uh, offering for a particular job that she was looking for to, to hire. And it's a high level job. And uh, I said, so how does that work? And she said, well, in Oregon, you can't ask what their current salary is. Right. Anymore. That's true. And That's true I in was a lot like, of really? States. A lot. Of yeah, states. I didn't yeah. know that because when I was in HR, you could. You could yeah. say, what is your current salary? Right. And now you can't. And she said, well, they do that because they don't, they want the, the, um, they don't want to discriminate, mm -hmm. you know? So if a man comes in and he says, well, I was making a hundred thousand dollars. I want a hundred thousand. A woman comes in and says, well, I was making 70,000. Right. I want 70,000, but they're doing the exact same job. The company shouldn't, I mean, it's, it's unconscious right. bias, right? right. <laughs> or whatever. And so I never knew that. So I, I, that was new to me. And so it is interesting. Uh, we should get an employment lawyer or somebody on the show because it would be really interesting to hear how companies do that. Like, how do they decide on their salaries? Because you could do a Google search, mm -hmm. yeah. but it doesn't necessarily tell you much because it's so broad. Yeah. I, you know, so, it might surprise know. you to learn. I also have a, an HR podcast called Human Solutions, a HR podcast for people who love HR. And uh, I do it Since with when? a regular. I in, yeah, I know. It's, it's a, I, uh, for AIM HR Solutions in Boston, Massachusetts. And Massachusetts has a really fascinating, um, uh, is, is fascinatingly progressive in terms of what, in terms of the way it protects employees. And I am going to ask my employment lawyer, my uh, uh, employment lawyer uh, buddy, uh, Tom Jones, to to join us for this conversation because yes. it would okay, be but I'm, really useful. My mind is blown. How did I not know that you had an HR podcast? How know. long I, have you been doing it? Um, we're in season three, short seasons. Like we've only done probably 30 episodes uh, over wow. the last couple of yeah. years. Yeah. Well, I mean, you, know, what do you, know? you don't know about that. Stuff. Like I do 30 shows. Like, what, what, You have yeah. no business like keeping up with all the nonsense that I, I do. There's no expectation well, that you would know. But that but. one I would be really interested in. Yeah, it's good. <laughs> it, it is. Uh, it's really fascinating when you think about because so many of these conversations are your jurisdiction may, you know, may be different depending on what state you're in. But generally, um, you know, you there are a lot of, of protections, more protections for employees than, you know, when you and I were actually actively studying HR. No. Right. Because, so. and that's what my friend was saying is she said, you know, back in the day, you kind of went off of whatever they wanted or what they offered if it was in the range. Yeah. But now it's like, this is what the job pays. Yes. It and doesn't matter if you're a man, woman, uh, it, it, or whatever gender you relate to, it doesn't matter. Like, right. this is just what the job pays. This is what we're offering. Yes. And, and what's yeah. really interesting about it, like one of the things that it uh, and I don't know this if this is specifically, you know, these two things are tied together. But one of the things that I note is that the salary ranges as a result have gotten much, much wider. Um, we were just looking at a, a position that where the salary range started at 30,000 and went to 100,000 right? Holy For cow, that's the a same big... job title. And part of the reason is they want to make sure that they have a lot of room to promote people to the top of a salary range that makes it exciting and enticing to stay in the role longer. And so right. I totally get that. And you want to come in and you want to be making the highest, but competitive salary could mean we're competitive with the 30,000 or we're competitive with 90. It, it right? really, like you said, it really doesn't mean anything. Yeah, it doesn't mean anything. Anything. Until you get information about the job. Yep. So, yeah, that's interesting. Yep. All right. Good Very to know. interesting. Uh, OK, so you wanted to talk about the interview. Well, yes. Yeah, so I know that there's a couple different sides here. So there's red flags from our listeners that I want to share with you mm -hmm. uh, when they've been in situations where I asked an interviewer, how do you like your job and what do you think your biggest challenge is? And I was immediately met with defensiveness and asked something like, who's interviewing who here? Oh, big, huge yeah, red flag. Yeah, huge. And that's, <laughs> you know, I just want to add something to, to all of this, which is when you hear something like that, the red flag is is it's not, it could not, it might not be saying anything about the company, but it is saying the person interviewing you is bad at their job, right? Oh, for sure. That person doesn't know what an interview is for. And that's 
that's fine. Those people exist in the world. It's not your job to confront them or fight them, but it is a red flag to know that this person has a successful position at this company. And what does that say about the relationship that you want to have with this company? Just mm-hmm. another question to ask. Mm-hmm. Uh, let's see. I've had to go through long drawn out interviews and screenings sometimes just to be passed over for the job. How long does it take to know if I'm the right person for the job? So yeah. from Harvard Business Review, ex- 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 excessive interviews or a drawn out interview process can be a sign that the team or organization is overly conscious driven. Consensus driven. Oh, consistent. Okay. You know what? Let's redo that whole thing and have you read it. Okay. (laughs) Harvard Business Review says excessive interviews or a drawn out interview process can be a sign that the team or organization is overly consensus driven, indecisive, or has issues driving things to completion. Totally true. That could be one of the things. The other thing, particularly if you're in tech, is that you might have to take tests, right? You might have to pass coding tests or QA tests or demonstrate skills on the job. And we've heard tale of, you know, 10 rounds of interviews because you have to actually demonstrate skills to multiple groups that you're actually doing work with. And that can be incredibly painful. It it can also be a weird sign about the state of of the organization that they they pride themselves on moving quickly, but aren't able to move quickly. And and that's uh, like they've they've given too many people authority into the hiring process, which may be a sign that there are too many people involved in all the processes. It's an inefficient organization. So um, that can be really frustrating. So I'm going to actually see, I'm going to, I see it from both point of views. Of course. Yeah. (laughs) Right. Because I think it depends on the job. If you're high, if you're being interviewed for a high level executive position or high management, your process is going to be longer. Because mm-hmm. they're going to be interviewing more people. They are going to, it, the process is just going to be a longer, more drawn out pr- process because they want to make sure they get the right person for the job. Because from the company's point of view, it costs a lot of money to get the wrong person in the job. Right. And so they want to make sure, you know, that they're doing the right thing. Um, I also see this a lot with, if you're working through a recruiter, I don't know what it is about recruiting, like if you're working with a recruiting firm, but it seems like those kinds of jobs, if you are there, they're the middle person, it always seems like it takes a long time. And I don't know if that's because there's a lot of back and forth and you, you're you not directly corresponding with the uh, HR department or whatever, but, um, and that could be for a million reasons. I mean, you know, and so what I'll tell people is that, well, keep in touch with your recruiter. Make sure that you still let them know you're interested in the job. Make sure they tell you if the job has been closed, because I can imagine that sometimes the job closes and the recruiter doesn't go back and tell everybody. Yeah. So that's the other thing, too, is to be proactive and, and you know, get your hands in there as much as you can. Um, but yeah, I mean, if you're, it, it's just, I guess what I would say is don't, what is it? What's that saying? Don't put all your eggs in one basket. <laughs> yeah, that's a, that is definitely a saying. <laughs> so, yeah. you know, you've interviewed, you're going through the process, but keep looking because you don't want to just wait out for that yeah. position because who knows what's going on. Yeah. It, and, and you know, all of these things, it's a really fine balance, right? Depending because, you know, when you're talking about, yes, you're a senior level executive position, there are going to be many rounds of influence interviews, right? Do you have, essentially, do you have chemistry with the organization, right? Do, do your experiences line up? That's pretty easy to to suss out. Mm -hmm. But are you a right cultural fit? Well, you got to talk to a lot of people to make that work. I I think it's important to recognize that in some organizations, they don't put enough authority, invest enough authority in the recruiting process. And as a result, recruitment offloads right responsibility for potentially bad hires to many departments and that that just reduces or absolves each individual department of a hundred percent of the responsibility of hiring somebody that isn't a good fit and that's problematic right it's inefficient mm-hmm. problematic and it drags you on as somebody who just wants to go to work and contribute right and so 
like being able to see that when that is going on might be a red flag that it's mm-hmm. not a good fit. You got to really, you know, the balancing is you've got to really ask yourself, is this the company I want to work for? If this right. is the kind of stuff they're making me jump through, if I'm having the same interview over and over with multiple different groups, just because one group doesn't want responsibility for hiring somebody because they got burned, right? All of these processes come around because someone got burned sometime, right? We know that. Mm -hmm. Like, that's how we build policy. But it's also important to acknowledge that it might not serve you as somebody who's looking for a job. So something to be aware of. Um, The other thing I want to say, though, just on the, the, the other side of that, too, if you do get passed over, I, you know, that's hard. And that that's going to take a little bit of time to kind of get over the the RSD that mm-hmm. comes with that, right? Like that is definitely something to to have to deal with. And, and I know I say this, and it's really easy to say to not take it personally when it, you really feel like you're taking it personally, because it is about you. Um, but there's so many factors that go into hiring someone. And I will tell people, if you didn't get the job, I'm a big believer that it wasn't the right job for you. They saw something that wasn't going to be a good fit. We don't know what that is. Mm -hmm. We're never going to know what that is. But I just have to believe that that wasn't the right one. And you keep moving on and stay, you know, as positive as you can. And and you probably learned a lot along the way because you got some, you know, really good experience with interviewing. You probably got really good at talking about you and Mm -hmm. your experience and, you know, take the good out of that and bring it into the next interview. Yeah. Uh, I've been in interviews where bosses talk poorly or inappropriately about their employees. Terrible. Yeah. Red flag. Get out of there right away. That's I, huge. I, I, that's I, not OK. It's it's really lame. And and I, I think it's, um, you know, I, I I've been in situations where I feel like it's easy to talk poorly about both employees and managers. Right. Like it's so easy to to as an, when you're in the interview process, you find somebody that you kind of like and you say, like, here are some things that are kind of frustrating about where we are right now. You know, we we're in a we're in a lull. Our teams aren't aren't producing. We're hiring because we need somebody to re-energize. Right. That that level of honesty. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Is is a red flag. Hunter International reports if they're talking negatively or giving personal information away about current employees, it's a red flag. Talking poorly about their coworkers can show that the interviewer does not handle private situations correctly, may yeah. not respect confidentiality, and that the organization may not have a good culture. Yeah, I just it's, oh, I can think of agree. no situation in an interview process where it's appropriate to say things, anything like that. I agree, and it goes. That's the same advice I would say to somebody who is being interviewed. Don't talk about your uh, past employers in a negative way yeah. or coworkers in a negative way. Even if you left on the worst of terms, I would still sugarcoat that in a different you know, light um, because that is a red flag as an interviewer that if you're talking poorly about your other company um, and, and, you know, I know that there's things that, that there's reasons why you're leaving a job. Mm-hmm. Right. So, of course, there's going to be things that maybe you didn't like and you can be honest, but just don't talk badly. Like, don't talk in a way that, you know what I mean? Like, I don't know what the difference is about talking about your experience, but then not saying that, oh, it's a terrible place to work for. They're terrible. Yeah. They're, I don't know. I don't know. There's just there's a line there. Well, I'm yeah, I mean, it very you, well, can, but... you can speak about the facts of your experience without right. at coloring it with your emotional experience. Right. Yes, exactly. You can totally do that. It's OK. Yeah. And I just want to emphasize how important it is for you to interview them. You know, I, and again, we talked about this at the beginning, but I just think it's so important, especially when you're feeling stressed and you really need a job. It's really easy to just want to, you, you know, be whatever they want you to be or what you think they want you to be because you need this job. Um, but it is so important for an ADHD -er to really get the facts and as much information as they can around the job, the environment, who they're working with, what a typical day is like, what is the culture? uh, Can I observe? Like, can I go in? Like, can you give me a tour of where I would be working? Like, ask these questions because you want to get a really good sense if this is the right job for you. And I was just talking to my daughter. She's leaving her position as a barista that she's been working for for the last couple of years. And I was telling her the same advice. And, and 
I'm like, you know, she wants to be a waitress. So she's trying to get a job at a, to be a waitress. And I'm like, just go in and, you know, ask them questions. And we've been going to dinner at the different places that we think she might want to work at. That's fun. Yeah. And one of the places we definitely decided that was a no go. <laughs> So that was really helpful. <laughs> um, so anyway, I, you know, that's something else. It's like check out companies. Oh, that was what I was going to say. I just forgot about that. Um, when you're looking for a job, look at the industry that you like, not just the position. Because there might be industries yeah. that you're really interested in and you can find, you know, you can find openings that way too. Yeah. rather than just looking for a customer service job or whatever. Well, and that's that's really I, I, that's a really good point because I, I think we often underestimate the complexity and the breadth of the overall job market, right? There are yeah. there are companies out there that are doing something related or that service the company that you're talking to uh, that you may have never even heard existed. Some B2B mm -hmm. back-end company that also has great benefits and struggles to hire good people and, and keeping your options way, way open and and like going to apply for jobs with companies with brands you've never heard of, right? Like right. there are there are a lot of 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 companies out there that are that are you know out out that exist. <laughs> yeah, so, because if you believe in what if you believe in the mission of the company, whether mm -hmm. it's selling a product or a service or whatever it might be, that's just you enjoying your job more so than going to a company that you really don't care about. Yeah. You know, either way. Yeah. It's a little thing. Like I, I worked for a client in, um, in Edmonton once and I was, it was one of those experiences, right? Like I, I, it was a connection from a connection and I ended up working, doing some work for this company and they make, um, they make, uh, stainless steel pipe fittings for like r railings and kitchen supports and things like that. I like, I, I don't know who does that work when I'm standing in a kitchen, but now I know, again, I've just done work from there. It was a small company that out of Edmonton, Alberta, that ships internationally and has all kinds of clients that I have heard of. And they're really great. They're really nice yeah. people and they do good work. Like I never in a million years would have heard of, of them, that they even exist had it not been for a connection of a connection of a connection. So right, keep right. your keep your options open. Uh, we do have red flags on the job, starting with onboarding and starting a new job mm -hmm. from our listeners. After a week on the job and just starting to get the hang of things, another new hire started and I was the one management chose <laughs> to train them. Yeah. Not I, a good situation. I, I, yeah. <laughs> I also, I wish that wasn't, this wasn't the first time I, uh, this this was the first time I've heard that, right? Like that yeah, is, that not. happens so common and it's just one of those things. Like you just admit, here's where we are, new person. I'm exactly five days Seen, you're senior. Let's see well, if we can and, do this together. Yeah. And what I've also seen a different version of this, but very similar, is they get on the job, they're told they're going to be trained, and then they're never trained. Yes. Like they're just kind of thrown into it and they're never properly trained and they didn't get the onboarding yeah. training that they were uh, promised to get. So it that's sucks. also a huge red flag. Totally. All of this is bad. Like I'm not saying, yeah. I'm not saying, it, but I'm just saying, like if, it, like it's, it, and it's from a management perspective, it's sort of indefensible, right? There should be a program right. for for figuring these things out, and sometimes you deal with what you're handed. Right. Um, uh, from the Washington Post, you'll encounter this type of behavior in any workplace. Oh, I, I skipped one. It's never a good sign when you're immediately approached by one or more existing coworkers who are overly eager to share office gossip with the new hire. You know, really, what are we saying here? Every uh, th there is a little bit of mean girls in every office, right? Like there's a right. there's a little bit. It's if you haven't seen Mean Girls, it's clicky. It's about clicks, right? It's right. about like it, we, we we're trying to figure out whose team you're on. New hire, right? And, and exactly. It's just the social dynamic of of work. Uh, Washington Post says you'll encounter this type of behavior in any workplace, but when you're the newbie. You should enjoy some sort of honeymoon period free from office politics. If you notice an environment where backstabbing is common, it could be a sign of toxic work culture. Uh, right. Yep. 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 Uh, okay. I was hired for a job that technically didn't exist yet. It was for oh, a no. new building that had yet to open. For the first month, I had to drive to another office building an hour away from where I was hired to work. 
I was sat in a cubicle, and that was it. I was never given a single task or any instruction past, you can sit here. <laughs> well, I feel like there's an end to this story at some point. Like, at, eventually you did something, right? Or did you... I hope did so. You leave? That's so did you just weird. leave? Like that that feels like the setup to a to a joke that we don't get the punchline for. It. That doesn't sound very good, but it also doesn't sound out of the realm of possibility. No, and it sounds like a lot of disorganization in yeah. uh new hires. Yes. Yeah, it, it <laughs> With sounds a company, like a, disconnect. a building that doesn't exist yet. Yeah. Absolutely. And we run into this all the time. You know, my my wife does placement for SLPs right. and we would run into this all the time. She'd be complaining about the fact that HR for a school district just sees there's going to be a maternity leave. And so they end up hiring to fill that maternity leave way prematurely. So they you end up like double staffing because you hired somebody to take on this job that ended up taking on a maternity leave when the person who was leaving was only like three months pregnant, right? It was just That's like crazy. a massive disconnect <laughs> between recruiting yes. and the actual work. That's what it sounds like you're dealing with here. And yeah. it's not good. It's, it's no. definitely a red flag. But I, I am curious what the end of that story is. I am too. Yeah. <laughs> and if they stayed there and what was the what was the job? Yeah, like, that's right. just so interesting to me. We've yeah. got a greatest hits of uh, uh, red flags on the job. Shall we just burn through these? Yes, these are absolutely. Good. Many of our listeners spoke about not being given clear work expectations or their superiors being unable or unwilling to clarify job tasks or responsibilities. Mm -hmm. Yes. I had one person tell me that their supervisor said, I have my eyes on you. Yeah. For and what? I'm like, what does that even mean? No. Yeah, that doesn't mean <laughs> for what? It's negative. Yeah. But what does it mean? Yeah. Un unless it's followed by a wink, in which case there are right. more problems. Right. There, <laughs> right. Whole nother set a of issues set of and red Neither flags Neither one of those red flags is any sort of good. That's uh, right. Oh, actually, that reminds me of something that I do want to bring up. So when I was talking to my daughter about different restaurants in the area, I said, well, what about the restaurant that I went to for my birthday? And it's a nicer kind of Italian restaurant. And she said, no, because when I was there and I went to the bathroom, the owner like kind of like grabbed her arm, but did it in like a groping kind of way, like this like kind of sleazy type of way to like say, you know, oh, you should, you know, turn in your resume and uh, red flag. Yeah. I'm like, yeah, don't go there. Don't go there. <laughs> so oh, that was God. a red flag. I just, it just dawned on me and I wanted to throw it yeah. out there. Groping is generally a red flag. Well, and it wasn't groping like in bad areas, but still, like she <laughs> was really, uncomfortable it's with the arm enough. touch. Enough, yeah, no, that's it fine. was enough that was like this isn't quite right. Like, I don't know, yeah. So, anyway. Everything is urgent or an emergency. I tried to explain to management that if everything is labeled urgent, then nothing is urgent. No one seemed to understand that concept. Everyone was always running to put out the next fire. You know, there is that's a cultural issue, right? Yeah. That's a cultural yeah. thing. And it's, it's inherited. Somebody at the top was, uh, was a real, you know, sucker for urgency. And, and that became a and bit of identity of and lost the meaning of it. And that trickles down because mm -hmm. it, it can't help but trickle down until you stare it in the face and say, this is really like what, what we're really saying is go watch the Incredibles, right? If everybody's mm -hmm. special, no one is. Right? We learned the lesson. Right. We've learned this lesson before. It's not good for you. It's not good for the company. It, it does not create. It, it, I think there is a myth that that a company where where they treat everything urgent, the, the myth is that they're going to be more responsive to, you know, to client needs, to, right. to customer needs. That's not true. That is just mm -hmm. patently not true. It makes the company indecisive and it makes the company chaotic. And a chaotic mm -hmm. company does not respond to anything, right? Like it, right. it reacts and that's just feral. It's not, yeah. it's not, not healthy. a good environment. Yeah, not a good enough. Uh, I worked at a retail setting with a large hospital network. Uh, I was con consistently told to look the other way or give special or preferential treatment to VPs or other high profile employees. Um, so I, um, okay. A retail setting within large hospital network. I feel like there is context there that is, that is missing. It's not, it is a red flag. Like it's not generally healthy, but I, I also have worked in those kinds of situations. And like, you know, I was selling my, one of my first high school jobs. Like I was in a tourist situation and 
um, you know, the president of the company would come in, they'd get a Coke and a hot dog. Like what kind of a, what kind of challenge are we, are, are we saying, right? Like what, what is right. the, what is the preferential treatment that VPs and, and presidents are getting that is not appropriate? There is a line. Right. I'm not saying there isn't oh, a line. Oh, no, I totally agree with you because I was thinking like when I worked in retail, you know, when I, whenever our regional manager would come into the store, you know, boy, we were on our best behavior right. and catered, you know, whatever you need, we're mm -hmm. here for you. So, yeah, I, I do think it it some of that is just going to naturally happen. Um Looking the other way, I think that, I mean, depending on the context too, I think that that, like, if you're saying a VP is getting away with something that they shouldn't be getting away with yeah. because it's not okay for other like employees or whatever, like they're, I don't know what it could be, you know, then yeah, that is a red flag because yeah. you're also going, I mean, you have to ask yourself ethically, like, is this an ethical, you know, boundary that mm -hmm. I'm crossing? Um so, yeah, I, I think we would need more information on that, yeah, like you said, yeah. to kind of. I just I just want to underscore, like I recognize the complexity of organizations. And sometimes right. the fact that an employee gives a hot dog and a Coke to the president of the company when they come in is recognizing that this that we're all sharing a few pennies of that hot dog and a Coke in order right. to show off a little bit to the executive. And right. that's uh that's a, a a thing that is, you know, your sort of moral fabric uh, has to be able to to adapt to in one way or mm -hmm. another, whether it's OK or it's not. You get to answer mm -hmm. that question. I'm just saying culturally, a lot of organizations, that is OK. What mm -hmm. we're you know, when I hear this, I think about like Sam Bankman free, like, like look the other way when he's actively. Uh, an antagonist in his own story, right? These are these are executives who are taking massive advantage of customers and employees. And that's a very different thing than a hot dog and a Coke. So. Absolutely. Because I mean, I can see just the example that I gave about the the owner groping. Like if yeah. that, if she worked there and went and said something like this bothers me and they're like, oh, it's the owner. You can't, you know, you have to look the other way. That's a red flag. Yeah. Get out sure. of there. Yeah, sure. not okay. So yeah, it all depends on the context yeah. and what you what you're talking about for sure. As I was feeling the strain of the job, I would try to take time off to improve my self care and overall health and well being. But I was shamed for trying to take days off of work and told I was being selfish. I, this is such a button for me. Such, I know me too. Such a button for me. And I what I just I can't was I talking to you about this? This was a, a, a environment where somebody said um, I needed like we have a policy where a sick day like you take a sick day it doesn't matter how long you've been on the job if you're sick you're sick you go home and right. i approached my coworker or my my boss and i said i need a mental health day i am uh, i'm feeling the effects of my depression and bipolar and i need i need to take a day off i am sick but it's a mental health issue and they had to litigate that because mental health was not included in any policy around health, right? So this person ended up having to take vacation time for mental health time to, to heal oh. her brain. That makes me insane. That yeah. makes me insane. Right now, we are 20 years too late in solving this problem for right. our people when these complaints first started coming up. We are way too late in having these conversations about yeah. mental health. And and it it just shows, I mean, that is a massive, massive red flag. And I want to mm -hmm. punch something hard. Like I get so mad at that. So uh, not a company that cares about yeah. you. Yeah. They don't care yeah. about you. If they're still yeah. dealing with this, they're done. They've already, yeah. that, that is their, that's their signal. And I, I, for me, it's pretty black and white. Like if that becomes mm -hmm. an issue, it's like, let's go, we're going to go find someplace, someplace else. And maybe Absolutely. they make stainless steel pipe fittings. Um, there was a lot of mention of work-life balance, but management never tried to foster that type of working environment. This is a huge red flag, right? I agree. Because you, it, it, management, 
needs to be role modeling this so that their employees feel comfortable in doing it. Because if they're not doing it, there's that underlying expectation that you feel that you have to stay there too. Yeah. And it's not fair. And uh, uh, yeah, I think this kind of goes with the mental health. I feel like if you're not if you're really not getting that work-life balance and you're feeling that pressure, like it may not be the right job for you because well, it's not the environment you thought you were getting into. And, and let me tell you a secret. This is a little yes. secret. One like of the secrets. trends right now in benefits packages that we're seeing a lot of is unlimited time off, right? Mm. It's just, un, it's all PTO, personal time, and it's unlimited. Take whatever you want. That's a red flag, as it turns out, because it's really? a company that knows you're never going to take it. You're never going to take it. Because people don't take it when they have it. Yep. Yep. And they know that the peer pressure is too great. They know that any submission for time off is going to be uh, is going to be met with some sort of judgment and that once they do start taking unlimited time off, then they are under increased scrutiny for actually meeting the deliverables of their job. Not decreased, not the same. It's a natural artifact of historical management practices. So I would be super leery because I would say it's a massive trend to see this. It's unlimited time off. And yet very few organizations are really doing the work to understand how to manage employees in an environment of unlimited time off. So that is a little secret. That's really secret interesting. Well, and I have something else that that just came to mind when you were talking about that. I had a, a client who had a lot of vacation time and wanted to use it. And so in the summertime, when it's not as busy, um, they agreed that she could take Fridays off. Mm -hmm. And uh, but the problem was, and, and this actually is a good lesson. She felt like she had to put five days of work into four days because yeah. she was taking that Friday off. And so she was really stressed and putting a lot of uh, pressure on herself. But when she talked to her supervisor um, and some coaching with me, <laughs> that that wasn't the supervisor's expectation. Right. So that's also a really good lesson is that even though we may feel like we have to do five days and four days, that is not what her supervisor expected at all. She was like, yeah. no, this is your vacation day. You do four days yeah. of work. And you leave vanish. for three days and then you come back on Monday and you do four days of work and you're yeah. going to do this throughout the whole summer. Right. You know, so um, it is important to to have that communication and clear expectations because sometimes it's in your favor. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I would say, uh, you know, this is one of those things where um, as the employee uh, talking to manager or coworkers, one of my favorite things is your stress is not my stress. Right. Mm -hmm. I recognize I'm gone on Friday and that there is some pressure being put on me to be responsive, even though I'm not here on Friday because other people's needs other people value their own needs as highly as I value my needs. And they mm -hmm. will say, why aren't you there? Why didn't you answer your phone? Why weren't you available? Well, your stress is not my stress. And I have worked right. out a schedule as such. I'm not working on Friday. Same thing with remote work, right? This whole idea that managers were not good at managing remote employees yet. It takes time to figure right. out how to do this. It takes practice and the expectations. It, it is amazing how fast we slip into old habits of management, old stereotypes of management when we're challenged with, with experiences we don't understand, managing teams that are not where we can see them. It takes mm -hmm. generations of leadership, not just weeks of leadership to figure out how that works or even years. Like it takes time. Yeah. And so just be aware that everyone is learning. That might be another, not a red flag, but a, a white flag, right? Mm -hmm. Everybody is learning. We all have to understand that our managers, leaders, they're all learning how to do this at the same time. So we have a couple more. Um, here we go. There have been many jobs where there have been a lot of employee relationships that created an uncomfortable working environment. Ugh. Yeah, yeah, that happens a lot. I, uh, my first job in education, I was working for a team where it was just three of us. It was our manager and then the two of us. And it was, it was me, my peer uh, uh, was a, a lovely woman who was very good at her job. And she and our boss were dating and ended up getting married. That was very uncomfortable because their relationship 
uh, with the work was very different than mine was and mine was with her and the expectations I felt were different. I totally re- resemble that remark. Um, yeah, it's it's hard. Big That's red loaded because yeah. there's a lot of stuff that probably happens with that. Yeah. And and uh, I can imagine it would be uncomfortable, you know, especially if you know somebody's having an affair yeah. or, you know, yeah, like you just know more than you want to know. Yeah, right. Uh, I recently left a job where I was being harassed by a colleague. When I reported the behavior, I was just told to stay away from them. I couldn't stay in a job where my legitimate feelings and concerns were brushed off to avoid conflict with another employee. This makes me mad. Yeah. Yep. You did the right thing. It's not okay. Well, and I can tell you, I have a, a, a client too, who was being harassed and, uh, went to the supervisor they did an investigation and the person that was being the who um, was harassing was fired within three days. Yeah. So there are people that will do the right thing. Yep. But then there's a lot of people that don't. And that is unfortunate. It's not okay. A lot of conservative industries, while they may say they want people to be themselves and authentic at work, the reality is they do not want to change the system and have anyone rock the boat (laughs) because also people in power benefit from staying in control which is why cultural change is hard. Yes. All of that, yes. Uh, And I think the bigger the company is, the harder that is from getting away from. Yeah. So that's one of the things you have to decide. Do you want to work for a big company? Or do you Mm want to work for a mid-sized company? Do you want to work for a small business? Or do you want to go into business yourself? Like, you got to think of those environments because... Somebody, uh, again, another client who just got recently laid off from a large company, I mean... They are a number. Yeah. They are a percentage yeah. that got laid off. And that's how it is looked at. And it's not fair. It's not right. Um, but that is the culture. Yeah. Yeah, it really is. And I, you know, that that is the line, right? Do you want to go for stability of benefits, um, regularity of pay, fixed locations, you know, the the kind of uh, the big company feel? Or do you want to take more risks and maybe not have as great a benefits package and maybe have lower pay, but work for a company where your contribution is felt immediately and often? And mm-hmm. and that's the that's the smaller organization. So that's, it, you know, um, it's not easy. It's not. And I was talking to my older son um, because we were talking about his major and what he wanted to possibly do with it. And. And uh, having that conversation, too, around, you know, my biggest hope for both of my children, and I'm sure everybody feels the same way about their own kids, too, is you want them to be happy. You want them to be in a job where they're happy and fulfilled and they're making a difference. Yeah. Uh, and that was what I was telling my son is that, you know, whatever you choose to do, it's important that you really want to do it and you enjoy it because we spend way too much time at work to not like what you're doing. Right. And my mother gave me the best advice when I graduated from college. And she said, you know what? A job is just a job. Mm -hmm. If you don't like it, you get a new one. And I've always, you know, really held that close to me when I wasn't happy with my jobs. And I I would just add to that, your collection of skills is your collection of skills, right? How you Mm -hmm. choose to package them is not defined by a job title, right? Absolutely. Oh, Mike, that is so true because I can tell you, as an HR professional in the past, those job titles are so broad, so generic, so hard to like come up with like what everybody does. Like, it's just not a fair assessment of who you are or your skill set. I'm glad you bring that up because it's so true. Uh, Useful, I hope useful to some folks. Thank you, everybody, for who contributed to this giant list of red flags. They are all red flags. It's really wonderful to, uh, you know, if if for any other reason than to just remind ourselves that we are, we're not alone in, in seeing the complexities of the work environment tested. And that's what these red flags are. Uh, you know, you get to draw the line on which ones you, you're going to walk away from versus which ones you want to adapt to. So uh, that's it. Thank you, everybody, everybody, everybody. Thank you for doing this. Uh, we appreciate you downloading and listening to the show. Thank you for your time and your attention. Don't forget, if you have something to contribute to the conversation, we're heading over to the Show Talk channel in our Discord server. And you can join us right there by becoming a supporting member at the deluxe level. 
On behalf of Nikki Kinzer, I'm Pete Wright, and we will see you right back here next week on Taking Control, the ADHD podcast. Thank you.